Hi, everybody. Welcome. I actually didn't plan on staying behind the microphone, but we're going to work that out. I like to move around. So um, again, my name is Janet Tui. I'm a clinical social worker in private practice in Georgetown, Texas. I'm um, originally from the East Coast, um, but I kind of say I'm from all over because we're a retired military family. But more importantly, how am I here today? Well, in my family, we have at least 10 to 15 people with cancer that we know of. Um, and that's because a lot of people like to suffer silently. So that's why I say it that we know of from all different kinds. Um, at least two or three of those with breast cancer. Um, and myself, I was a donor of bone marrow to my brother more than 25 years ago. So I thought it was kind of interesting and ironic because I got asked to do this topic. This is their title. And as you can see, I'm in my brace. So I thought it was kind of ironic that changing lanes and, and slowing down and taking it easy felt really appropriate for me because when I fell and I fractured my back, I am completely having to do things very differently and working very, very slowly. And it's going to be a long process of recovery. So I thought it was kind of interesting because in essence of what I'm going to be talking to you about today, I actually had to practice. So let's see if this mic works any better. Hold on. Um, is this working? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Good. So if you, um, just a disclaimer, if you hear me cough, just because there are some people here who might, they themselves might be immunocompromised. I'm not sick. It's actually a byproduct of the medication that they gave me. So just like your people that are the survivors, they've got one thing that happens to them. Medi medication comes into the thing, and then all of a sudden, you've got another thing that they have to deal with, right? So that's kind of what's appropriate. But before we get too far into this topic, I want to get an understanding of who is here today, if we could. And that is, um, who here has been, their survivor has been dealing with this for less than six months? Ah, we got some. Who's been here that their survivor has been dealing with this for more than a year? Okay. More than two years? More than three years? Okay, so we got a lot of veteran people here, so no wonder you guys. So that's what I'm gonna, my intention is, to have you guys talk to each other. So I'm not going to talk to you very long. I want you guys, because that's what you're here for, is why are we still talking about this subject? Okay. Um, and just out of show of hands here, who else is also dealing with more than one survivor that they're taking care of? Okay, that's good to know. And who is also struggling with their own personal health issues and also taking care of their survivor? I just ask because that brings extra dynamics into play here. One other question is, is do you guys all consider yourselves co-survivors? Okay, good. I ask that because, you know, being prior military myself, my husband's uh, retired military, when you ask a woman if she's a veteran, she'll probably tell you no, right? Unless she's been in battle, she'll probably tell you no. So it's better to ask if you've served. Okay, and that's what you guys do. You guys are in service. But you also need to take care of yourselves. So one of the reasons they call co-survivors, does anybody know about mirror neurons? Okay, so mirror neurons are those things in our brain that pick up what other people are feeling. So there's that saying, if mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. That means you too. I mean, so one of the best things you can do to care for your survivor is to take care of yourself. And so that's kind of difficult. Now, you guys are vet a lot of you guys are veterans here, but those folks who are struggling, they feel like I shouldn't be taking care of myself. I need to take care of them. And that's particularly difficult. So let me talk to you about the difference between selfish and self-care. Selfish is when you only take care of yourself and that's all you do. Self-care is when you take care of yourself so you can take care of them. And if you fall, they're not going to be able to have you around when they absolutely need you. But sometimes, guess what? You get to lean on them too. And you forget to do that sometimes. If we make ourselves happy, we can vibrate that into other ways for them. 
Does that make sense? So do you understand why I'm going to tell you again and again, you need to make sure you do your self-care. And when I talk about self-care, I mean reconstitution time. And when I, the reason I bring that up is because I just said to a client last week, I said, okay, we, she's like, I don't have any time, I don't have any time, I don't have any money to take care of myself. So she managed to get about two to four hours to herself after we managed to work things around, and she went shopping. Well, she's miserable. I said, do you like shopping? She says, no, I hate it. I'm like, that's not reconstitution time. <laughs> you really can't do that. It would be not fun for me either. I do not like to shop. So when I recommend reconstitution time, it's not being on your video games. It's not just zoning out to the television. It's actually getting quiet in nature or some place where you can turn your brain off for a little while. When my husband would come home on the ship and we'd only have, he was gone 300 days of the year when we were forward deployed, I found that if we spent four hours in nature, we felt like we had a week's worth of time together. But if we spent a weekend at home and just in that extra time, we would get busy doing stuff and we wouldn't be able to turn to each other. So I wanted to remind you of that piece. Okay. So let's talk about changing lanes. How many people here had other plans when the diagnosis came up? Yeah, so all of a sudden you're going on this pace and boom, 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 and then you get to slam on those brakes and now you're going to have to change lanes. Let me tell you, I had all sorts of plans after I fell. I was like, New Year's Eve, I'm roller skating. I'm Next day I'm going to hit, I'm, I'm going to take 2019, I'm going to put a good health habit in once a week. That didn't happen, <laughs> right? It didn't happen. No, of course not. So guess what? I had to lean into this and having to slow down and having an injury, right? I had to lean into it because I had that practice of I know if I don't lean into it, my emotional state will affect my physical state. And I'm going to recommend, because I see a lot of men here and I'm loving that you guys are here, I say this particularly to the men because society doesn't give you a lot of permission to feel your feelings. Let me tell you, feelings are information, okay? And if you don't take time to feel your feelings, it will come out in two places, either in your behavior, people are drinking, they're speeding, they're road raging, whatever it might be, or it's gonna come out in your body. Headaches, aches and pains, avoidance. So you get all that? So I want you to say that feelings are all good, no matter what they are, they're all okay. Can you repeat after me? Feelings are all okay. Okay. It's just information. Believe it or not, as simple as this is, this is what I spend a lot of my time teaching adults to identify their feelings and how to feel their feelings. You know you're neurologically going to feel a feeling for about 90 seconds if you don't attach a story to that. Let me explain what that looks like. And I've done it again and again with people. They'll come in, they're anxious, they're upset, and I say, okay, Zero to 10, 10 being the worst. How angry, upset, hurt, disappointed are you? And they might say, I'm a seven. Or they might say, I'm a 10. And I say, okay, for just 90 seconds, I'll set that timer. Just as long as you want and as much as you want. Just feel the feeling without, without attaching a story to it. Just give yourself permission to feel it. And know what happens? Almost every time, it comes down. Except, here's the, the difference. If you allow yourself to feel the good feelings and sit and doing that same thing, that actually magnifies. So if you're in a place of gratitude of love and you want to magnify that, just sit with it. Just sit, notice it in your body and then say, okay, where are my, where, how do I feel about this now? And then you can start, once, you, once the temperature of that comes down, you can start making different decisions about what you want to do about that. Sometimes nothing at all other than giving yourself permission. And when you give yourself permission, you are telling your body, you're telling your feelings that you're okay. That everything I'm feeling is okay. What you do with it, now that makes a difference. Not okay, okay, okay? So, we got the changing lanes. 
Slowing down. Okay, what's some of the things that you guys have had to slow down for? Anybody? Doctor's appointments? How many people are sick and tired of going to the doctor's appointments and scheduling things all day long? Yeah. Finding ways to get help? What else? What else? What have you had to, come on veterans, what have you had to slow down for? Food prep. Huh? Food prep. Food prep, yes. Were you a cook beforehand? Yeah. Were you the main cook beforehand? Absolutely, and research. But if you've got kids, then it takes like double the time. You've got to make the kids answer yeah, <laughs> the other one. <laughs> Absolutely. Go ahead. So no, talk no. about kids. How does that? What do you have to do differently with kids? Uh, they don't eat all vegetarian only and greens and you know. So I mean, Absolutely. homework and baths and uh, diapers and uh, yeah, no, you, you know, you're making different breakfast, different lunch, different dinners. Non-stop. It is non-stop, isn't it? Okay, so then you have to ask for help. And one of the things that was reminded to me last night was my cancer support group. And I sat with the, my survivors and I asked them, what's some of the things you want the co-survivors to know? And they gave me a list, but one of those things was that it's okay to be you and to live your life. And how many of you feel a little guilty about doing and focusing on yourself. Yeah, okay. So that's why I'm here to tell you and remind you, if you don't live your life, that makes them feel sometimes like a burden, right? And if you don't recharge that well, you're not gonna be there for them. So I'm gonna remind you again, take care of you, take some time out. And that's gonna be one of the most important things that you do is to parcel out and ask for help. Now, interesting, the other part that they did tell me was that they reminded me that, you know, a lot of people start to fade away. You know, you've got all of a sudden, you have all these friends, and they all say really well-meaning at the moment, if you need anything, please let us know, right? And how many of them faded away over time? A lot of them. Absolutely. just it. What are you willing to do? Please tell me what's your strength? What do you like to do? Can you help me organize for two hours on Saturday? Can you sit with me and help me get out of this fog that I'm feeling and help me figure out what I need to do next? My girlfriend's mother just passed away suddenly and she was lost. Of course she was lost. And what I I was there. I just said, okay, let's help you clear through things. Let's help you clear through things. But it's amazing how many people don't show up. And the other piece that you need to understand, why we need to slow down, is that sometimes the second year and the third year can sometimes be tougher than the first year. Because all of a sudden you've got a lot of help in the first year, and then people start to disappear. And the survivors, sometimes you forget that, oh, they're still working through this. They're still challenged with this. Last night in group, I had a woman who is feeling very despondent because she's about to do her scan. She's three years out. And everybody would think, oh, well, aren't you look great. You've got your hair. Everything's fine. No, she's shaking. She's angry. She's a mess because she's about to have her scan. Makes sense. You guys recognize that. And you forget and you want to forget sometimes that this is in your life. But your new normal, your change, comes along. And you change, they change, and sometimes for the better. Sometimes not for the better. Examples of people I've known who've had things change for the better. Their marriage became stronger because they realized what was really important. All this other stuff was nonsense. They really focused on the, and they simplified their lives because they had to. Others? 
because they didn't deal with their own feelings or because of things that have happened in their own past that this may have brought up, it started to disrupt that relationship. So I recommend highly. I know people don't want to go to therapy. Believe me, I get it. Nobody wants to go to the dentist either. But I'm going to tell you, it's sometimes refreshing to have somebody who's not involved in this directly. But sometimes you really need each other to talk to. So one of the things I'm going to do is I'm going to pass out these pink cards. And I'm doing this on purpose. Um, the white cards were for you to um, put any questions or thoughts that you might want to have asked up here. The pink cards, I'm going to encourage that you take at least two cards and put your name and your phone number on them. Because each person in here understands what you're going through. You need each other, right? And sometimes getting away from your story and listening to somebody else's story can be helpful. And the reason I picked pink is because I don't know if you've ever found a name and a phone number and you're going, where do I know this person from? I have no idea. So cancer survivors, breast cancer, I figured pink, would you guys would take, ah, okay, I recognize this. This must be from YSC. And by the way, give YSC a round of applause. They did an amazing job of organizing this place. So thank you. Okay, so what um, is, how far is everybody coming from? How many are from Texas? Texas, Texas, okay. Okay, and South outs Carolina. South Carolina? Florida. Florida, Ohio, Vancouver, Georgia, Columbia, everywhere. Canada. <laughs> Canada. Canada. <laughs> you came out from the far north, so you're, so is it warmer here today? Oh, yeah. Fabulous, <laughs> enjoying it? Good, good, good. Okay, anywhere else? California. 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 Chicago. Atlanta. 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 Also another Canadian. Do you guys know each other? <laughs> okay, so you might want to get to know each other, right? <laughs> Okay, New York, right on, New York. Anybody else? Michigan, okay. And you're Connecticut as well, great, great. Okay, good, so you might wanna pair up with somebody here who might be from the general area. You just never know. You might be just a foot away from each other, or you might not, so. Um, in the meantime, I'm gonna get you, I want to do a, a exercise with you guys, if that's okay. But before I do, I'm gonna show you some things that you can do to Soothe yourself, okay? And you want to do those things that are what I call coping skills, self-soothing skills, while you're feeling decent because you want to pair that in your brain so that it automatically feels calming when you're feeling intense emotions. Does that make sense? So I'm going to pass around, first of all, the chocolate, dark chocolate, because dark chocolate is good for your heart. You need about an ounce a day. It's also good for releasing those endorphins, so you were addressing the taste. So then I'm going to help you address your sense of smell. And smell is the fastest way for you to get into a memory. Is anybody here with seasonal allergies? Okay. Are you allergic to anything? Do you, do you guys want to do a test with me? And I will have people come in with seasonal allergies because Central Texas is bad for them. And they'll have red running eyes and drippy nose. And I'll have them just breathe this in. Okay, it's just peppermint and eucalyptus. And I'll have them breathe it in just for a few minutes. And all of a sudden, their allergies start going away. <laughs> just breathe them in. And then you went, I'm going to pass these around. And you, can, and you can take whatever seems to connect with you. With, as you put the essential oil on the cotton pad, just remember that the oils don't put your fingers near your eyes because it can sting. So I, that's my caveat. Um, so there's a bunch of different kinds. Citruses are to help you wake up. Peppermint helps with stomach aches, headaches, to help sinus issues. Um, these florals help relax as well. And then um, one of the ones that people like a lot is what's called chilpil. That's one of the ones that's called, um, and it's got Patchouli, sweet basil, chamomile, uh, sweet orange, there's a few things in there. So I'm going to pass these out first, but then you can look at these and I'm just going to One of the other things is, let's say um, 
you don't want your coworkers knowing you're smelling essential oils to help you calm, energize, you know, those kinds of things, you can take an empty lip balm, put a cotton ball, a little bit of oil in it, sure. and then just like you're going to put on lip balm, you're smelling it, and you're, you're you've got In, in my <laughs> office, I put a couple of drops of that in the back of hand soap. Yes. So when you're washing your hands, they think and we have a fancy soap dispenser. I just put the cheap Sam's Club soap. Yep. And people are like, oh, your hand soap smells great. Isn't it? It's great. You can use them for a lot of things. Now, my caveat also for this is make sure when you're using it on, top, on your skin topically is that you usually need to keep it with a carrier. That means like an oil or um, a, a lotion of some sort. And again, because we're talking about cancer folks, I'm going to recommend no parabens in your lotions. And the reason being is that some of these oils can be toxic. So you want to be able to, if you've endure them too long, too much. So make sure you do your research with that as well. Okay. So then the other thing, and I'm going to center around this side, for your mental well-being and zen feeling is also finding affirmations, positive things for you to hear, feel, connect with. And so these are Louise Hay cards. Anybody know, anybody know who Louise Hay? You guys familiar? Oh, Okay. So Louise Hay actually healed herself from breast cancer by doing lots of meditation, eating, and so forth, not by treatment. Um, she's, she actually died at the age of 90-something just a few years ago. So, but she's very much into the positive affirmations and how our bodies show different areas. They come, our feelings, as I was saying, come out in our body. She's very much into that. So I'm going to... Um, this is a gift from one of my clients that... Uh, was struggling with. And so what you do with that is just randomly pick one, and that'll be kind of like that message. Just kind of intuitively feel it and then pull one out, and that's how that message is for you. So I want you to guys to kind of continue to self-soothe and feel good about how you're feeling. All right. And then I'm going to show you one more thing. So that's, that's for your mind. And then I'm showing you one more thing. What did you find? I'm at peace with my sexuality. <laughs> That's fantastic. I'm so glad that you were at peace. <laughs> Imagine with I your sexuality. I gotta get the wrong pen upstairs. Though. There you go. And then this yeah. one is what's called a weighted blanket. Are you, anybody uh, familiar with weighted blankets? Fabulous. I've heard about them. Okay. Huh? I've heard about them. Ah, then I'm, do you mind if I? I just, yeah. I'm gonna experiment on you. So the weighted blanket, and this is actually a lap blanket. So you just put it in your lap, and it is heavy. It's seven pounds, and. What you need is about a, about a pound for every 10 pounds that you weigh. And it's very good for the nervous system, for people with PTSD. And you get PTS from all of this, right? You do. You don't have to necessarily have the disorder without having some post-traumatic stress. Okay. Um, it's good for people with restless leg syndrome, ADHD, because it helps calm the nervous system. By doing this, and they call it the hug when you hug your shoulders, you can watch how your Emotions change by changing your body posture and changing how your parasympathetic nervous system reacts to things. For example, when you're really elevated in anxiety, you can put ice on your eyes and just watch your parasympathetic nervous system change. Something you could also do, I don't recommend this in maybe a meeting spot, but is what's called the superhero pose, and you put your arms on your hips wide stance, and you look straight in the mirror because what's happening is you're opening up this area and then you say some affirmations. This is going to be a good day. I'm going to be okay. Whatever it is that you feel that you need to say to yourself, go ahead and do that. I had somebody, it was actually my supervisee because I also supervise for licensure. She goes, oh my God, that really does work. Yeah, some of these things look hokey pokey stuff, but they really do work. Um, and Because if you think about it, if your body, if you're feeling upset, what do you normally, how does the body go? You get tense, you kind of maybe roll if you're, your roll your shoulders forward, yep. A bit. Absolutely, absolutely. But if you feel good, <coughs> you open up. So watch how your body is, that'll tell you. Okay. So now you got some toys to play with, things to do, and let it continue to move around. How are we doing on time? So I'd like for us to kind of share. I'm going to pass the mic for, between each group, and if somebody wants to share, I'm going to trust how you want to do that. If you've got a speaker in your group, 
I might share for the group. Um, and then see if we can get some pieces of wisdom. Larry's going to be my helper, so he's going to write down some of your awesome ideas. Okay. What did I do? <laughs> what, what's the question? What's the question? Well, well, I, I, I think that in our discussions, primarily it was discussing sort of, sort of, we were discussing uh, uh, our day to day of, 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 let's say, it's not our body; we're not experiencing it in the medical, because these women are so young, you know, the, you get all these different opinions, and we don't want to do these tests because you're young and it doesn't follow the the, the regular protocol. So I guess if you take what somebody needs from that, that's a good question. I don't know that I, we didn't ask that question. We we were more talking, getting to know one another in a standpoint. That's okay. What's some of the things that Patty's done to help you cope with what's going on? Well, I'm thinking about what she's done to help me cope. I can't say we discussed that. <laughs> <laughs> We did discuss that, that we've, we've lost some friends because maybe people are scared, don't know what to say or how to act around you. And the reality is, is you shouldn't be any different than if I were completely a normal, non-cancerous person. There's actually a Facebook um, um, group for co-survivors as well. I don't want to speak on behalf of our group unless someone else wants to talk. No? No takers? Oh, I don't mind. I'm like an extrovert, so I just fucking love this stuff. Okay, so perfect. Uh, um, yeah, so I, we tried to stick to the questions, but we got a little bit off topic. But the, the big commonality with the first questions, I think, for everyone, um, which was, you know, what do we want? Uh, what is one thing we want or need right now? Which was time for ourselves or just time in general. Um, and depending on everyone here's situation, because they're all different, right? Our wives are all going through different things. Our lifestyles are all different. Some of us have kids. Some of us don't have kids. So depending on that, it, it, it allowed... It, some of us have less or more time um, to be able to have time for ourselves. And um, I think some of us that did have more time for ourselves and others, at least I'll speak for myself, was one thing I felt very guilty about spending time alone when I felt like I should be there in more of a supportive role. So it was hard for me to enjoy being in the mountains or going fishing or going hiking alone by myself, even though I needed that time, it kind of took away from it. Um, and one thing that helped me specifically cope with that, and we didn't manage to get to that question with everyone else, but um, was therapy, like things like cognitive behavioral therapy and things like that, I found very helpful for me to get more in touch of why that was a big deal in the first place and kind of rationalizing why I was having the problem with that. Um, so I, I would just employ everyone here. I know it's hard for guys because we're like, well, we don't need therapy. Therapy's stupid. But... But it did really help me. Um, so, yeah, I'll leave it at that. And if anyone else wants to jump in that second question, feel free. Okay, so time for yourself, all right? Okay, so does anybody in the group have some tips on how to get time for yourselves without feeling guilt? Anybody? Okay. 
You schedule the time, absolutely. Make an appointment with yourself. I actually had to do that with myself. I had to put my name, and I didn't, couldn't say appointment with me. I actually had to put my name on there, so I would actually do it. Um, having your spouse be part of your own um, wellness plan, because you also have to have a wellness plan. Because if not, you're going to absorb the, the issues, the stress, the whole forth. They're not going to have you there. So you can say, OK. One of the things I get to do with my husband, because he does work so hard, is I say, all right, honey, we need you to take some time for yourself. So how can you do that for you? Sometimes I want to be alone, too. You know, it's not, I love him. He's wonderful. But guess what? They don't want you hovering all the time. They don't. You wouldn't want them hovering over you all the time. So you're just reminding yourself, it's OK. I'm taking care of me so I can take care of them. Okay. Any other thoughts? Some of my mothers that couldn't, can't get any time alone at all, and this has happened on more than one occasion. Um, they can't even get time alone in the bathroom. They have made meditation spaces in their closet or their car. One of the things I'll have people do is make a deal, let your spouse or your significant other know that before I'm coming home in the door, I'm going to sit in the car for 20 minutes, 30 minutes, whatever it is, meditate, quiet, be that space, because you know where I am, I'm safe, but I just need that turn everything off space. And when I was working full time, going to school full time, taking care of a young baby, the only time I had was the 20 minutes in the car. So guess what? I use that as my space time. So do what you can. So thank you guys. All right. How about this group? I don't know that we had any real consensus on um, things that we needed. Um, but we, there was certainly a, a a consensus on the one thing that was helping was ed was exercise of one form or another, running, cycling, CrossFit, any of that stuff. Um, one person mentioned needing time, um, more close friends. I'm trying to remember what else <laughs> was mentioned. So, sleep. Yeah, that was mentioned. I don't speak for the group, but I like to exercise. Well, I do both. I, I cycle, so I cycle sometimes groups, sometimes by myself. It just depends on how I feel that day. Anybody else want to add anything to this group? Make this one quick because it's uh, almost over, right? So um, the one thing right now that would be helpful, uh, we pretty much all agree that it's finding time for me, right? And then uh, so... We're, we're meeting other people and uh, finding a better way to communicate. Uh, those are kind of all the things that we talked about there. Uh, one thing we've done to cope with the situation, uh, saying no more at work, at least. Um, and I think I've heard other people say that in their personal life, too. And then uh, go work out. That's a way to get a little bit of uh, steam out. I noticed even for my son-in-law that in the beginning, you, when you got healthy, you were exercising and doing all of that. And then you kind of go along, go along, and that kind of work got in the way. But now you're back into that again. And it makes a difference. You can, and I'm like, oh, I've, I've got to learn to, I'm learning from him that I have to get back into the exercise thing too because some of the things that worked earlier he kind of gave up a little bit, and now I've got to get back to it, if that makes sense. Absolutely. Someone in our group called the exercise the, the free, free antidepressant. Absolutely. Yeah. Exercise is an antidepressant. In fact, if most people go to therapy, depression and anxiety often alleviates almost all the way for a lot of people within six months just by doing the skills that you need to do. And really, it's accountability, right? So... Let me answer some of these questions because I think you brought up a good point. You know, how do you deal with this when this is a recurring and so forth? Well, remember I said I was going to table laughter for a second? How many of you guys have ever heard of Norman Cousins? 
Okay, one person. Okay, great, fantastic. You must be a therapist. <laughs> um, Norman Cousins went to Russia and came back with this illness. The doctors thought he was going to die, et cetera, et cetera. And he said, well, if stress created this illness, there must be some way I can do it myself. So he checks out of the hospital, checks, goes, I think he goes across the street into a hotel or something, grabs all these movies. I think some of them might have been Groucho Marx or something, but and belly laughed for three days. Miraculously, he cured himself. So here's something. If you are scared, one of the things you need to do is belly laugh because guess what? You can't be scared in the same place you are laughing. So find people and say, what makes you laugh? I can't say, since it's being recording, I'm not going to tell you what it was, but last night we were laughing so hard in group because of some of the things we came up with. And it was very healing. So somebody who was having a really strong, hard, tough time was able to move that. So that's one thing. Um, one of the things we do in our family is we call it a celebration of life party because we have had so many people with various kinds of illnesses that we just start, we have a celebration of life and we get together and we bring life into things. Finding new things that you are interested in for them, for yourself. Somebody asked, how do you deal with PTSD? One of the things I really recommend is a therapy called EMDR. It's eye movement desensitization reprocessing. I work with a lot of veterans, combat trauma. Uh, it's one of my specialties. I've seen people go from one area to another within a short amount of time. It's a little tough work, don't get me wrong. But once you do it, it's amazing. The first person I ever learned how to do it 20 years ago, um, she was having nightmares three or four times a week for over 20 years. We did it one time, and she stopped having nightmares. Now, it's not, that's not going to be for everybody. You know, some of my combat vets, you know, if they have to plug in, they're ready to do the work. One guy went and got rid of his, his PTSD in three months. So that's one piece. But there's also, there, there's different kinds of work out there. There's um, what they call naturopathic kind of work, alternative things. There's Qigong. There's energy. There's all sorts of things that are out there now for healing. And if you want more information, definitely, I will give you more. Um, and then the other thing I want to talk to you guys about is holding space. How do you hold space and not take on things? So let me give you an example. One of the things that happens is that you guys want to fix things. I had one guy in who said he wanted to cure her cancer. I'm like, you think you're God? Well, I should be able to fix her cancer. He really meant it. There was a part of him that meant that. And I'm sure he wants to. I would want to. But you can't. That's not your job. Your job isn't to fix the cancer. Your job is to assist to help to hold space. So as an example, there was something that I was struggling with, and I couldn't figure out why. So what I did is I took all the chairs out from my dining room table, and I did what's kind of called parts therapy. I talked to each emotion, saying, what is it that you're trying to tell me, and what is it that I need? Now, my husband, brilliant, didn't know what I was doing at first, just sat back. He didn't walk away. Try to, you know, some people would walk away to give you space or privacy. Um, he didn't try to come and hug me either. Because if he did, he would have interfered with my work. What he did is he held space. He just stepped back and let me do my process and was there for when I was ready to come to him. So emotionally, what you do is you need to hold space, not take it on, but just give that surrounding kind of like imaginary hug right, or circle so that they can do their work in their safety. That's all you really need to do. Listen. Ask occasionally, hey, how are you doing? I haven't checked in with you in a while. Hey, I need to let you know how I'm doing. I haven't checked in a while. If any of you have um, remember 9-11, that was a while ago, right? But I can tell you, people are still coming into my office because of 9-11. And I was in Boston, by the way, at the time. So there are people still affected by 9-11, and that was a lot while ago. If you people are still being affected by 9-11, guess what? It's only been a few years for you guys, too. Give yourself a break, okay? It's okay that it's not, every day is not sunshine and roses, but there are days that are. And if there aren't any days that are sunshine and roses, come out and reach out and grab a chocolate kiss on your way out, knowing that, you know, you're being loved in some way, in some small way. Does that make sense? Does anybody have any questions? No? 
Did you get what you needed today? Does anybody need something that maybe the group might be able to help with? Okay. I have a question. Yes, please. And let me ask you, are you in a culture where you're, it's okay to express your feelings or not? Yes. It is? Okay, good. Sometimes cultures let you, tell you you just need to pull your bootstraps up and keep going. So how does she deal with this? I'd like to actually turn it over to the group for a minute, but I actually have some ideas. So she is a five-year survivor, and she just lost her mom a few months ago. How does she cope? Any ideas? Thoughts? And my husband within, what, not even six months. Yeah. And what we did is we even did a birthday cake um, on, on the person's birthday, or we talk about the person. I think I, I like talking about the person after they've passed away because it, it keeps them alive. And so I, it, it's helped me over the years. Okay, I'm not ashamed to admit it. When I lost my grandmother, I bawled. I bawled. She was, even to this day, it was the apple of my eye. And this has been, like, since 2002. And after I got that out of my system, I also did things to memorialize her, such as I got a brick with her name in it. I sat down and had picnics with her by her graveside and talked with her. I remember her, even to this day, and her birthday or... Um, the day of her passing, and I continue to celebrate her and thank her. If you are grat grateful, if you lean into it with gratitude of those things, you end up making less space. We come into this world in two ways, either with love or through fear. If you feed the love, you're going to grow that love, and it makes less room for fear. Does that make sense? So you feed your love of your mom and the gratitude of the little things that she's done. And if you need to, you can make a memorial box, and little things that you roll up and you can put them in, little memories. Or you can ask other people, hey, can you put some memories of my mom? And then you can pull them out when you need them. Little things like that. Lots of little tributes. Any other thoughts? And I'm sorry. If you had a favorite activity that you associate with her, um, I, I find, at least for me, that doing that thing, whether it be on the birthday or, or just any time you feel like it, you know, but going out and doing that thing. Um, my grandfather used to love taking us out to uh, the, the river to watch the freighters go by uh, to lighthouses and then take us to dinner. So we ended up finding a way to go do that. And that always brought us a little bit more love. That was great. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> She's going to go shopping. <laughs> well, thank you, everyone, for your kind attention. It was great to meet you and, um, you know, continue to pray and have a great sun. Enjoy the sunshine. By the way, walking in sunshine is also another antidepressant, so 10 to 20 minutes or so, if you can't be in sunshine. Somebody gave me a rumor that if you put mushrooms in the sun, you actually have more vitamin D, but I don't know about that one. So <laughs> that's what their, their oncologist nutritionist told them that. Yeah, there's an oncology nutritionist. Did you guys know that? Our foods are our medicine, so be aware. They are to your, meds, your food will change your moods.